<laughs> a little out of practice. Hey, it's all right. Well, hello everyone and welcome to The Harvest, where we discuss all things cinema and story. And as we learn, you learn as we grow, you grow. My name is Xavier Garcia. And I'm Jonathan Garcia. And this week we've got something fun. Something yeah, different. you know, it's been a while. I figured, you know, we can spice it up a little bit. Yeah, well, we've been getting kind of like these small little gaps in our episodes, but, yeah. uh, you know, I mean... It's, it's a good thing. We've got work that's, that, that we're working on. There's a lot of things that are happening, which we'll talk maybe a little bit about at the end of the episode. But first, let's introduce our, our guests. Yes. We've, got, we've got guests. We do. We've got friends. We do. <laughs> um, we've actually got Eric Monzon, who uh, um, works a lot as our line producer for a lot of our yeah. work. He's also just a straight producer. And uh, Hans Padilla, who does a lot of our DIT work. Yeah. But let me just, uh, let's turn the camera over to them and have them introduce themselves. All right. Thanks for the intro. Eric Monzon over here. Uh, as Xavier said, I'm the, uh, the line producer on most of the uh, Mount Harvest work. So. Yeah, and I'm Hans Padilla, and uh, along with being a DIT, I'm also the resident negative Nancy. <laughs> and so, uh, if, if there's anything that you might like, I probably won't like. <laughs> That's Thanks. awesome. It's Thank you guys. Cool. Pretty cool. Pretty accurate. It's pretty spot on. Ooh. Okay. So this week, yeah. uh, it's going to have to be a little bit more free flow because there's a learning curve here. Right, right? yeah. We yeah. were all in the same studio together, but we tried to set it up in a way where, you know, um, not only are we somewhat social distanced, but we're also, um, we're able to hear each other, but like it's kind of like separate parts. And so yeah. we'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Today's episode, though, episode 32, we're going to be discussing a little bit about production design. Yes. and. Um, and it's going to probably split into multiple episodes. We're probably going to have maybe two or three episodes just, just, just talking about the vast world of production design. Because it's one, now we're going to be talking about the art department. We're going to talk about art directors, production designers, and just some of our favorite films and television episodes that have award-winning production design. Yeah, no, I think that there's so much in production design. It's so big world i don't think we could probably fill it all up in one episode so. no definitely not but we do have our negative nancy nancy yeah. and we uh, yeah. and eric to kind of chime in a little bit yeah. about some of the shows that we've all been studying okay. together <laughs> for some of the projects that we've got on the uh, down the pipeline mm -hmm. so, and it'll be great to hear it from you know from a lion producer's perspective and a dit and he's not just a dit but he's very creative and art and stuff like that and so he's well acquainted hans is well acquainted with you know the concept art world, so it's it's I'm excited. All right, so to get this conversation started, um, you know, a lot of things. Sometimes, oftentimes, when we watch a, a show that we love, and we're like, I don't understand, but like, why do I love it? There, so ultimately, so many different components that go into that. Yeah. First and foremost, we all know, and we always talk about the writing, mm -hmm. right? The writing is always key. If the writing is good, chances are the show is going to be a good show, right? But that next step where it becomes confusing, where people are like, is it the cinematography that's beautiful or is it just the visual? Right. That's what we're going to talk a little bit about, the visual, the production design. The last episode, 30 and 31, was specifically about the cinematography. So mm -hmm. if you want to go back, check those out because it will be helpful for you to know a little bit about the actual framing of a shot, the lighting of a shot. But now we're going to talk about what's in mm -hmm. the shot. Mm -hmm. And for that, we've got a couple of examples that we've highlighted and we've put on our list. And I think what would be great is for us to have somewhat of a roundtable discussion about why we think these examples uh, are great examples of production design. And maybe we can come up with some examples of bad production design. Cool? I think that's great. Yeah. All right. Let's start with film. Right off the bat, the one film that um, we all love in uh, you know here in studio that we talk a lot about when it comes to design and how it was handled uh how design was handled is the film 1917 mm -hmm. and the reason yeah. why i want to talk about that is because production design for 1917 had to be a, very, a little different than what uh, 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 traditionally how a film is made mm -hmm. right because a film you've got a camera it focuses on a very specific section and then outside of that frame it's chaos it's Correct. wood yeah. beams it's you know light yeah. poles and, yeah. but in 1917 because of the style of the one take shot right. 
you needed to have a world that was created, and when you, the camera act panned left, it still needed to be that world. Right. A lot of times you're thinking about these sets like that. Everything has to be practical, and the environment, and every angle has to be alive. And so, you know, being able to create a set that will encapsulate the whole world is, is challenging, especially for a crew, you know? Extremely challenging. Yeah. Extremely yeah. challenging. And they taught, you know, what's beautiful is for those of you, here's, a, here's an early tip of the week. Um, and I've brought this up before many times, but for those of you that don't know, you know, Roger Deakins has a phenomenal podcast, the mm -hmm. Team Deakins podcast that he does with his wife. And they talk a lot about some of the challenges and some of the successes that they had. 1917 was a film that he um, DP'd. So if you want to get a little bit more insight into some of the films that we talk about, definitely check that out. Having said that, for those of you that don't know, 1917 was a film directed by Sam Mendes yep. mm -hmm. and DP'd by Roger Deakins. Um, and the production Dennis, designer was Dennis... Gassner. Dennis Gassner, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, and I think they actually interview him in oh, that yeah. podcast, yeah. But we're going to talk a little bit about it. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this over to our, to our friends uh, in studio, to Eric and, and Hans, because I, I want to know first from you guys, what, what did you guys like about the film from a visual perspective? And it could be very generic, very broad in general, but what attracted to you visually? Um, Hans, you can go ahead and kick us off. Oh, I mean, other than uh, Roger Deakins' beautiful cinematography, uh, especially uh, as I'm a big, I'm a big fan of uh, war films, and so I think we were discussing before uh, stuff like not only Saving Private Ryan but classics like All Quiet on the Western Front, um, Black Hawk Down, Thin Red Line, and. You know, one of the, the, the things, oh, Apocalypse Now, I can't, you know, can't forget that. But it, it is the, the, the maneuvering of the camera, because it's not enough just to set up a dolly for that movie. Right. But to be able to tell a story, it's basically, imagine having to uh, uh, navigate between hundreds of actors. You, you have to navigate explosions and then <laughs> navigate the lighting. And then navigate the camera, and all somehow it is basically like a dance number, and everyone's following the rhythm. And so, one of the, the the aspects of production design is to be able to tell that story, to t to have that that rhythm, that 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 show happen, in and tell a story. And so that is one of the, the, the really one of the, 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 more, the upper echelon of what, what pr production design is. Even though to, it's a little bit more subtle, it's not like Star Wars where you have like all these fancy gizmos, you have over, overarching like buildings and all that. It's a, a film that, that takes place, you know, during the Great War in 1917. Uh, it looks real, it feels real sounds real and when the camera moves y you're in the movie yeah you're, you're in, in on that set you're in the trenches yeah. and that's what good production design especially at that point what, what to me draws me into the movie is that i feel like in no man's land yeah yeah no it feels like it, it feels like what they produced there was a 360 degree movie where you hear you smell you you are there you're in that moment i think um i must have been probably about 17 minutes or so into that movie and i didn't read anything about it beforehand i didn't know that you know they, they were trying to go for you know one long or what would look like one long shot but i was about 17 minutes in and i was uh, i was turning to my friend who i was watching the movie with and said hey this looks like this is like the longest scene ever they're probably going to keep going the rest of the movie with this there is no turning back on this right now and uh, that was something that I, I think you know this film accomplished really well was when you get to the end of it, you realize, wow, we went through this whole journey. And as Jonathan was saying earlier, I mean, they had to be perfect with that. They had to be perfect with every angle, every light, every explosion. Um, you know, making their way all the way through that was uh, that not. You know, it takes an expert to be able to do something like yeah. that. And yeah, and that. and you know, everything that they're describing is everything that they felt. From the production design you know it's the aesthetic of the story it's the time uh the characters actions it's the feeling um all that is pre-created and you know and you know you'll know a successful movie if their production design was 
amazing, yeah. you know. And that, and and that that's really what yeah. production design is in a sense. Yeah, it's it's what's seen, right? It's the art yeah. within the frame. Mm-hmm. It's everything that's seen. But you know, I I was actually I was having this conversation earlier. I think actually it was with our our show producer with Chelsea talking about just like what production the 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 senses talking mm-hmm. about how the senses um, are are applied to production design. So here well, here's what I mean by that. Things as simple as like fabrics, mm-hmm. right? The fabrics of a person's um, costume right you know the choice of fabric the, the choice of texture mm-hmm. you know texture obviously a different like a tweed jacket is going to reflect light differently and uniquely than you know like polyester plastic mm-hmm. anything like that and all of that is connected to the art that is being displayed yeah. on camera like what's being seen the mood. and yeah. yeah and i and i i do I, i'm a huge i'm a firm believer that if you can surround your actors and this is probably the theater in me if you can surround your actors with as much reality of the story as possible not just the visually right because and i'm not talking just green screen versus actual practical mm-hmm. set but i'm talking like if you can insert some smells in there mm-hmm. if you can insert you know uh some some audible influences of like what would actually be happening in that world you know so like if you're in the 1850s if you can get some horse horse sounds in there mm-hmm. and you know just like the sounds of wagon and things like that to get the actors also responding in a way where it translates visually for the audience. It it does add to the production design, and I'm you know, and the the, the from the simplest things like hand props to you know the more obvious things like set pieces and actual you know the choice of uh, a, a very specific type of wagon, the covering on a wagon. Sure. Is it yeah. is it is it the right period you know time frame for that covering mm-hmm. and. Things like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. All of that paint brushes, uh, paint colors being used on a wall. And, yeah. You know, a bathroom is usually like this, you know, white or gray. But then, you know, like, let's throw up a big red to show like this is a bloody scene. This is the way that we're going to design this room. And so, yeah, I mean, it's all about that aesthetic and feel about the world and the environment of the story. And all of it is, you know, and it's not it's not as simple as. Okay, it's 1917. So what gun right. would so and so hold? It's the, it's like it's not just being period accurate, right. right? That adds to the design. It's also like, well, why would it be that gun? Let's talk about from a story perspective, the choices that you are making visually, how they affect story, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because it could be the gun, but now let's talk about the gun itself. Is the gun worn down? You know, like, are we going to make this gun really... And this is something that oftentimes really bothers me when you watch independent film, right? And you watch, like, Roman films. And you watch the Roman soldiers... No, well, wrinkled clothing, even worse. Roman soldiers with perfectly pristine helmets. Like, like, they just came out of the package. Like, wait, were you not thinking about the design? Like, you know, like, why why is this this entire... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, why is this entire, like, you know, armada of soldiers, or or, sorry, like, this phalanx of soldiers, why are they all, like, brand new out of the package? Yeah, they ordered it in bulk from Amazon. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. And, And the funny thing is, is that Exactly when you were talking about the gun, it's that type of authenticity is important. Yeah. One of the things, and to talk and talking about 1917, Saving Private Ryan, I referenced before. One of the, the the key aspects of that film was Steven Spielberg wanted accurate uh, sounds from the M1 Grand, and there's a, a specific sound when the cartridge is ejected, that ting, that, that, that's particular to that rifle only. And, and he literally, they, they, I think they also scavenged real guns, yeah. but they recorded hundreds of thousands of audios of, that, of them re- reloading the weapon, of the gun jamming, of, you know, the, the, of them uploading the amu- ammunition, because that, the way it operates, uh, in the mechanism, it was particular to that weapon, but also particular to the sound of war. So, you know, it's something subtle, but I think everyone remembers in the movie, every time someone will show you, you hear that ding, and, and it adds to the atmosphere of the, the movie. And, you know, and, and people don't think about that, especially now, all the guns sound the same. It's yeah. all Glocks. <laughs> yeah, it's like... 
how how it, why does this like every gun every gun sounds like a desert eagle? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 like, yeah. Yeah. One thing I hate I hate silencers. Everything sounds like someone's farting uh, through a barrel of a gun. That's not how silencers yeah, yeah, sound. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ting, 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 you know. It's like if you listen to a, a silencer, it does not sound nothing like that. But there's but it it, it goes to show like that it's. You know, certain things uh, uh, need to be accounted for when you're really, and not to, you know, not, I mean, I, I'm not going to uh, say that that's bad production design. I'd say that's more of an aesthetic choice, right? You know, in no country for old men, you know, you're not going to probably find a, a, a silencer for a shotgun that, that you're going to be able to shoot through a pillow and not make yeah. sound, but it's, it, that was done as aesthetically for a reason right. and so i think one of the aspects of of, of 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 being a good production design for a film is knowing what you're aiming for right. and that and that's kind of what sam mendes did i mean he wanted to do something completely different yeah he wanted to go like what hasn't been done and yeah and there's movies that have tried to do the one takes i um, trying to remember exactly off the top of my head um but it was more so of like uh, actually no it wasn't a one take it was a um, uh, more of a head cam view, but it was a long, long takes. But they always like, you know, we have the problem with story, and we have to cut, and we have to jump here and jump there, and there's you know different places we have to go within our story. But the fact that he was able to successfully do this one take in his world and do exactly what Eric says, put you inside of it, yeah. is exactly what. The, the, the makes it so successful. Well, it wasn't a gimmick. Is the right. thing. It wasn't a gimmick. It wasn't the one take for the sake of one take. It was right. it was a story choice. Right. And exactly. according to Eric, you know, like what he said, it was to immerse the viewer right. in the environment, in the moment, and give them a world that they have perhaps never experienced right. before. Right. And, you know, it's funny that you say that. Um, you know, as far as the the, the production design. Uh, uh, just a little fun fact. And again, this also came off the the Deacons podcast. But um, you know, when Gasner. Um, was asked uh, by Sam Mendes to do it. Uh, he was he was actually on board to doing the new the, the new Bond. That, I mean, right now it's uh, it's end of December. Mm -hmm. It's in the process, I think, of being filmed as we speak. But he was going to do that, and Sam Mendes was you know texted him, "Do not do the Bond film." <laughs> I have a film, very ambitious, sending script, and literally, <laughs> you know, which is like it's actually kind of cool because he, you. Again, a production designer and the importance of a great visionary. Yeah. They sometimes think, sometimes people think, oh, it's all the director. Yeah. It's like it's it's not that person. That production designer is such a key person right. to the to the the actualization of the of that visual um, desire that a director may have. That's why a director has a DP. You know, mm -hmm. like because the like the DP has certain technical knowledge in order to. Bring the, the yeah, bring that that vision to life. Yeah, visual style as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's you you know, said like Sam Mendes wanted to do something outside the box. I, it's actually I got a quote. He literally said, "Let's do something interesting," and that's what it was: an interesting look into a world that is enormously horrific, but with grace and style. And yeah, and you think about the shots, and a lot of times you're thinking, you know, you have multiple people in the scene in one camera, and you're figuring out how am I able to capture every essence of that scenery, you know, they have, you know, they have two shots, they have three shots, you know, they have all, but it's so well done where, you know, um, you, you, you don't miss anything. You're, you're able to get enough of each actor it's not like you know you point at one and then you right. point at the other. Yeah. It was it was so well done to just be able to be you're the you're the fourth person yeah. in there. You know what I mean? Listening in, like what do we do? How do we how do we get around this? And uh, and the camera moved so smoothly throughout the scenes that you even forgot there was a camera there. Yeah, and and it was like it was constant. You know the the movement was going and the yeah. mood and the feeling was just constantly beating and it, it, it was just it was I think it was successful you know I, we've I've been talking a lot to Eric about um, you know it's just the project that we're currently working on right and like all of the research just the random things that I've had to research in order to uh, uh, explore 1850s New Bedford right we were just talking about pencils pencils yeah we were talking about pencils right did they have erasers on them yeah did they have erasers did they not have erasers I mean that's a that's a design that's a design situation, and 
ha- you know, like for example, Gassner had to study mud in order to, you know, in order to like correctly depict and design mud into the space. And like talking about pencils, like su- such a someone may think, oh, you know, like just get a pencil in his hand. But no, like the type of pencil is it? How how is the pencil? How does a pencil end? Is it like a, a sharp point on one end and then flat on the other? Like no. It's actually pointy on both ends. Well, why does that matter? Well, it matters huge. It really does because when you watch it and you see that, it may be subconscious. Mm-hmm. It may be subconscious to the viewer, but it does do something to you when you're, you're thinking, that pencil is so it's weird. Well, I th- and I think you hit on it as well, too, for the actors. I mean, it really does impact the actors and how and, and improve the actor's performance when they actually are able to step into that world. And it's, and not just the actors, but everybody else in the crew, understanding you know wardrobe and understanding you know, these other elements to, to the film. Uh, one thing that I find interesting is that uh, some, some production designers, they may be going off of uh, some existing, existing world. So I think a really good film uh, or series of films were the Harry Potter films, for instance, mm-hmm. where they've built this world and he has something to be able to go off of versus, you know, a production designer or, or, um, or a director who is looking and creating a world, you know, completely from scratch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always interesting whenever, especially things like, you know, 1850s New England, where or we have some concept of what this may look like. But then, the you know, you watch these period films and you step into it and you're like, oh, wow, this is so impressive. You know, whether it be, you know, the, you know, McDonald's, uh, what was the one, uh, the McDonald's one with uh, Ray Kroc in the, in the 1950s um, versus Green Book, you know, similar era. The but founder. The founder, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the founder versus Green Book, which is you know we're looking at you know relatively similar era, but they 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 bring their own sort of piece to it because it's you know what does a McDonald's look like in, back then versus what does a uh, you know a, a banquet hall look like back then. Well, I'm, I'm glad that actually that you brought that up. Like bringing up Harry Potter transitions us perfectly because now we're going to talk about production design from the worlds that you create versus the worlds that already exist, mm-hmm. right? And like the 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 level of research. Um, and you know purposeful application of art so like for example you know there's this one rule about sci-fi right where sometimes people think oh sci-fi like you anything goes you can right. create it's like actually sci-fi is the most strict yeah the most strict in e- uh, as far as rules are concerned for mm-hmm. filmmaking mm-hmm. of any genre right. because the your rules for this sci-fi world you cannot break them you cannot because the moment that you do you break you break the the I don't know the fourth wall. You break the the, the magic of the moment. Yeah. You know, and people are like, "Oh, uh, that's that's that world is is flawed." Right. 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 Uh-huh. You have to. You're forcing yourself to create rules that aren't that don't exist. And if you break them, the movie falls instantly. So it's like, whereas you're in a world that's already has rules and everyone knows them, and you can uh, you know uh, break the you suspense can bend of disbelief exactly. and things. And so you're just like, oh yeah, because I know that rule. Right. But in a sci-fi, it's a lot harder because no one knows it, and they're like, oh, this, the, the director broke his own rule, and then they're like, all right, right. I, I, I'm good with right. this. So, so I'm glad we're able to transition. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about Avengers. Um, Avengers Endgame, the highest grossing film ever to hit theaters. Yes. And, and that's, it's kind of unfair because it's built on IP that, Sorry, yeah. you know, that we grew up with. And so it's like we're already going into the film uh, you know, with like expectations as an event. People have been waiting for this Yeah, for the years. Avengers films are events. And so it's, a, you know, so it's like those are the films that are actually going to be the blockbusters uh, right. in theaters. It, I mean, it's like almost almost three billion dollars can you believe that beating uh avatar's <laughs> record i like that's yeah. that's yeah that's silliness which is actually pretty impressive for avatar um you know i mean that's all really uh, cameron's you know yeah. ip gone with the wind and blue in, in blue characters <laughs> 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 that, you know, i'll let hans talk a little bit about i thought it was dances with wolves that's right dances with yeah, wolves that's dances right with wolves. my bad uh, okay, so the Russo brothers. Yes. Um, Russo brothers and the production designer was Charles Wood, who also worked on Infinity War, Age of Ultron. He worked on Doctor Strange. And so it's interesting that once they actually moved and used um, Wood for, you know, uh, for both Infinity Wars and Endgame, um, there was continuity in, in this universe. That's huge. 
yep. so big. The continuity in the universe that he brings to like, and not just the two films back to back, but to like the Marvel feel, the Marvel world. Because if you watch some of the other earlier Avengers, they feel different. But by the time you get to like Infinity Wars and Endgame, it's almost like, it's like, did they step it up? No, they changed production designer. Right. And that's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Is it not? Absolutely. Like that one man could cause... Well, the world's got to be seen together, you know? That's the whole thing about a production designer. They're, they create that aesthetic, the, the, the world, the, the feel and the look of the world. And, you know, they work obviously along with the director and DP and, uh, and others. Uh, but, but that's the idea is that if they don't work together people already have that feeling of like oh this is right. this is a different movie yeah this exactly is, this is, or they'll say this is a different director and then they'll start throwing words like oh you know this is not as good as that one or as good as this one and it could just be as simple as they're just two different worlds yeah well eric brought up harry potter right yeah. like harry potter suffered from that where it had multiple directors each you know each one to the, to the next one and multiple dps and they're and although hey it did really well, obviously, um, but the the continuity there from film to film to film wasn't like what the, uh, the Avengers films was able to accomplish, especially over the last couple of films, or rather Marvel films, let's right. just say that. Now that you've got, you know, the, the same production designer taking the helm to bring what he, you know, the success that he had in Age of Ultron into the final two events. And you know, I, I, I see it this way. Um, I this, this is how it kind of works in my brain. You know how we always do this. You think of like when you have that ability to build on top of that. That's why every, every film was better. Like it became better. Everyone would say that, you know, some, I mean, you, you, you'd be surprised. Some people would be like, oh, I like this one, Avengers 1 or 2. But I think uh, as a whole, most people were like Avengers. And then the second one was, you know, it built up. It got better and better until the last one was like the best. And you rarely hear that. You yeah. rarely hear the last movie was the best one. Right. And you it's know? kind of unfair, though, because they did film those together at the same time. Sure. Kind of like the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, like, they, they went through this epic filming and that's why the lord of the rings stands out like it and there isn't people till this day will say there isn't a flaw to any of those films like so well, the that's continuity the, is really important right that's the idea is that they that never separated you have someone who understood the story and was able to build off it because remember even though they did it all together they were different worlds in this thing right and they all have to be connected right. from the previous movies right. and so you know that's that's you know that's what made the film so successful going from the first one all the way to the last one so i feel like that can divide into two two elements happening here at the same time you've got the continuity of this production design from film to film to film but you've also got the relationships Mm -hmm. the relationships between director and 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 dp Mm -hmm. and production designer and i feel like when you get into a groove with a group right and let's say you, you know you're filming like lord of the rings you know it's the same team for all three films, and so not only is there a continuity, but there's also, you know, and not only were they, you know, they were filmed together all, you know, back to back to back to back. You've got now continuity in the visuals, but then continuity in in the relationships where you then begin to develop a shorthand. You know, like no longer are you having to explain so much in order to achieve just like a small creative choice. You could just be like, with a look, I can communicate, this is what we need. <laughs> right, and you think about, for instance, Nothing. Spider-Man was changed. Yeah. And how do you introduce a new Spider-Man into this world? Um, and you know, and even introduce new costumes and, and, and the new feel and just make it just work perfectly and seamless. And it's because you have a production designer that created a world that you know, made it easy for other characters to enter into it yeah. and yeah. make it work. Yeah, and, and you know, it's interesting too because then you watch the Spider-Man films and you watch the Avengers films and there's a difference. Mm-hmm. There's a production design difference, but the ability of having an amazing production designer is to be able to create a world that you can, you know, like you said, these characters were able to seamlessly enter into. Mm-hmm. And um, and that, and you know, there was so much anticipation built for this mm-hmm. film that it didn't matter. Like, they could have... I, I, 
I look the success that they did have was because of the choices that they did make from a design and a personnel perspective. But I feel like if they had chosen anyone else, it still would have done well. Whether or not it would have done as well, I don't know. There's no right. way of knowing. Right. Um, but to throw it to um, to Hans and Eric, just a question. Um, even with some of the work that we've done, um, you know, as Mount Harvest and having, because I, I, I want to touch a little bit about like the relationship. So there's the continuity, obviously, of the visuals, but then the continuity of relationship and how that leads to better visuals. Um, can you talk a little to that? Um, can you talk a little bit about your personal experiences going from project to project in, in the fact that like we kind of keep uh, a core of individuals that are always together and just kind of like how that does lend to the visual choices because there is the shorthand. I, I don't. I don't know if um, you can speak a little bit to that. Either one. Whoever wants to jump in. Well, I would say that it's uh, it's it, it's. I think it's central to being able to have uh, a set, uh, uh, basically a production where um, there is that uh, being comfortable. Uh, having that creative freedom, mm -hmm. in in order to to be able to go to the director, and and establish that not only that shorthand but uh, being able to say hey like we might need to change this, we might need to change this, we need, uh, change that, we need, might need to change the clothes on this character, you know there you'll be surprised how a lot how many things that become iconic in movies like a jacket was just something that was tossed on by the set designer. <laughs> and then I was like, I love that. And then that character has that jacket for the rest of the movies. And that happens a lot. Yeah. And sometimes you've got film students that are talking for hours about like the choice. Oh, yeah. It's like, why was it the color yellow? Yeah. Well, it's yellow because it talks about the, you know, the this and the end. And like the direct production designer is like, no. We, you know, he was cold. We need a jacket. Yeah, yeah. He threw that jacket see, on. See, Han Solo's black jacket and his white shirt desperately means that he's always balancing the light and dark. <laughs> and that he's really a moral great character that not neither good or evil. He's just morally ambiguous. And you asked Harrison Ford. I was like, nah, I don't, it's the only thing they had. Uh, <laughs> that, that happens. But you know what? Um, but... When you've got a team that has that understands the vision, they can make those kind of on the spot choices and know when the choice is wrong, right? right? So it's like they wouldn't have grabbed just any jacket and just thrown it out like a feather, you know, like jacket and thrown it on Han Solo because like that wouldn't have made sense. They were so well communicated. They understood the vision. Yeah. They were the team was on the same page. They, you know, we talk a lot about how we create. You know, it's it, it might be overkill, but we do create um, uh, lookbooks mm -hmm. and 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 story bibles for all of our films because we love to be able to share. Everything that we've gone through in yeah. the research process with everyone yeah. so that we can all be on the same page. And I think that that is huge because it gives not just our crew, but our actors the confidence to be creative on set. And it also gives us the peace to know that they will be able to bring something fresh and not come right. out of you know, from a random area, but right. because we created a world right. that was that they get it, they understand it, they see it, they feel it. They can bring creative ideas and we'll be like, yep, that's that's within our world. It's not outside of our world. Exactly. And it's so it's that, almost as if they've been a part of the research process all along. Right. And so they're speaking to the same thoughts that right. we, I mean, I, I'm going to throw this to Eric, you know, like coming in because I, you know, Eric um, was instrumental in the building phases of a blood throne, mm -hmm. right? But he wasn't necessarily there throughout all of the research that you and I had to go through in order to create a blood throne. But he came in and it was almost as if, boom, why? He had all of this, all of this research that we had done. Right. And the actors talked about that too. They felt like they came in so prepared right. because they were able to look at this document. And that helps the yeah, relationships. That, absolutely, absolutely. And that, and that hones in again, um, you know, like the ability to be expressive, like Han was saying. Even in the movie, I was thinking about um, the Dark Knight with Christopher Nolan. You think some of these directors are very stiff, and this is the book, and you read it, you do it, that's it. it Michael Jai White talked about how 
um, you know, uh, first of all, you know, actor, what's his name? Um, Heath Ledger comes up to him and, you know, ask some questions like how do and Nolan's like what do you think and Michael Jackson is like are, are, are you asking me you know like <laughs> you're Christopher and, Nolan you're Heath Ledger and you and you can ask questions like that I I may not know and I may ask hey Hans what do you think about this because I'm comfortable enough to know that the foundation of the world has been created for him to express himself within it yeah correctly right and not just bring in the feather jacket yeah. when we're talk when it's supposed to be right. some sh earth earth tone type right. thing, and he's like, well, this one because of this, that. And that's what Christopher Nolan does, and that's what Scorsese does. That's why he's always like having conversations with his crew. What do you think? Oh yeah, bring what do what you want to do, and then we'll see if it works. And that comes with a lot of confidence, right? You know, like um, a lot of confidence first and foremost in the screenplay, a lot of confidence in you know, and I, I don't know, I don't know necessarily what Christopher and Jonathan Nolan do when it comes to like the research and how they present that to their crew, but mm -hmm. they, he certainly has a team that is intimate. They talk, they're, they're in the same vernacular. They're mm -hmm. talking the same language, which is again, you know, what I, you know, the, the original question as far as like what I wanted to, you know, when I threw it to you guys as far as like having that relationship and having that, um, that familiarity with one another, you can achieve that through a document like a lookbook. Yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the things I always say is, you know, don't ever hold back on the screenwriting. Write your script, tell your story, write your story, and we will find a way, you know, from a, from a line producer standpoint, to, to make this happen, to, to make this uh, look and feel the way that it was intended in, in, the, in the ideas, in the, in the mind of, of, of the writer. Um, you know, when we look at, uh, we look at a blood throne, for, for instance, uh, you know, there were scenes in there where we did have to adapt a little bit. You know, there was the Karuka scene where, you know, the way it's written in the, you know, in, in the script is that, you know, you have horses, you have, uh, you know, the carriage and, and, you know, and we, and we adjust and we adjust and we make it look as real and as authentic as possible to the scene. Um, and I think that's something that over time, you know, we've just continued to get better and better at. Uh, fast forward up to Underground and there's that one iconic scene where, um, where, where the, the hunters are, are walking in, they're entering into the city. And it's very clear, you know, we're looking down Rose Alley in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, this is an area that, you know, today, there are elements of it that still look like they did back in the 1850s. But then at the same time, too, there are elements of it that look like 2020. You know, they, these, you know, these are modern, modern times. So, you know, throwing up a blue screen in front of there, um, creating this world, but then also translating that through the costumes, translating that through, you know, the other set pieces, the extras, that are walking through, uh, walking through the alleys, and when you piece that together, it really does create this. It's it's a world within a world, yeah. you know, really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and you think of a, one of the shots is just the cobblestone and the feet, and which you know you don't. It's just pointing straight at that, showing you know that that's 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 from the time. You know, you, you, if I pan up, you'll probably see like a, a modern day doorbell, you know? And so it's like... No, 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 we wrote a scope those out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but oh you know what I mean? Goodness. Like, it was just a, it was, I mean, we, we was like, this is the the times, the cobblestone right. here, boom. And right. then, but it also helped the shot because it's like the feet creating tension, movement, you know, what's about to happen. You know, I don't see their faces. Uh, what's going on? All I see is feet, cre feet creeping in. So, yeah. And to Eric's point, some of the reason why we could sh make those shifts in, I mean, essentially production design, right? Like the scene for the Karuka scene required horses, carriages, there was supposed to be movement, but the reason why other people could speak into how to make this scene possible with all the limitations. I mean, we had so, I'm talking, you know, Murphy's Law was literally just vomited oh, on yeah. us, right? And how, how then could we, how, we at that point had to step back and be like, what do you guys think? How can we make this work? You know, and everybody that had went, gone through the lookbook, we were all speaking the same vernacular and we were able to figure this out on the spot yeah. because there was that camaraderie, there was that, you know, same mindset, same sensibility, everyone was on the same page and therefore everyone could speak to it and come up with an immediate on the spot solution to make the scene work mm -hmm. when we have, you know, time is wasting, therefore money's wasting, we only had that one night to shoot it, you know, we had limited equipment, things were like breaking, I mean it was like, it was chaos, yeah. but we figured it out. Yeah. Um, I think that's the, the I'm so sorry, no, I'm you off. I think that's the strength of what a what a good production designer is capable of, uh, because you know one of the things in film on a set it's 
it Murphy's Law is almost uh, like a lower deity on set. Like everything that could go wrong will grow wrong. Uh, you you talk about it, a cop, Apocalypse Now. I was, I was rewatching the movie and they were talking about how they couldn't film for months on end because. I think uh, uh, Martin Sheen got injured. Uh, there was flooding constantly, and then they had to r literally move the set somewhere else completely and rebuild it so that it wouldn't flood, but still keep the look that they're in Vietnam, even though they were not in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, and the same thing with Star Wars. Uh, that scene, <laughs> yeah, and and some and some of the scenes. You know that scene and when um, Hans rescues Luke. He cuts the tauntaun. You know, it looks like they're in a mountain, right? They're in a in a in a in a snowy uh, a snowy just basically uh, hellhole. It was shot in the back of a hotel. They they literally run they they literally ran out of money at some point, and they only had enough time and uh, to be able to grab a few actors, grab a few lights. And go to the in the middle of a, of a snowstorm and go to the back of the hotel and shoot in the backyard. They didn't. They didn't go to like uh, Mount uh, Fiji. No. They didn't. They didn't it go. Looks like it. Yeah, <laughs> but that is what a production design is supposed to do. It's not only it's it's not only to bring the uh, the vision of the director and the film, but find ways to work out that vision with yeah. uh with with the circumstances that you're given because yeah. not sometimes you you won't get the location you need um sometimes the weather is not going to be in your favor and there's going to be certain things that that might happen like i mean every everyone we all remember jaws the shark didn't work mm -hmm. for most of the, the film and they had to work to to make the film uh, yeah. uh, thrilling. So it's like, so what do we do? Don't show the shark. <laughs> Don't show the shark. Shoot it in a way where you still feel that tension and yeah. danger. One of the uh, one of the great TV shows that, that I love, I've been you know absolutely addicted to uh, recently, was Peaky Blinders. And the amount that they talk about the war, and especially in the first season, they talk about you know the the Great War and the war scene. They never once show a war scene over there. No. And they're able to convey that with, you know, this kind of back from war, you know, shell shock generation and they're in, you know, half 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 the show takes place in this in this bar, you know, in the bar, in the house, in the street, and they're able to just co convey so much about like what happened obviously to them and and in the war um and you know, just the mindset of of, of these folks um of the Peaky Blinders, but uh you never actually see them do that, you know, have have that flashback back to the war. They're able to convey that, like similar to Jaws, where they're able to tell that story without showing necessarily that story, mm. at least visually. That's that's a great point. Yeah, and, and it's amazing. You know, when when you jump over, right? And I'm glad you jumped into television because we were going to talk about we we said story bibles. You know, and create story bibles for films. Well, obviously, television needs a story bible. It's the only way that you can maintain continuity between not just episodes, but subsequent seasons, right? Mm -hmm. um, and therefore it gets everyone on the same page. It gets everyone talking the same language. It gets everyone understanding, okay, not only is this the goal and the arc of the story, but this is like how all of this is gonna be pulled off visually. What I love about Peaky is, yeah, certainly that, but also the fact that like, mm -hmm. there's, they went, because they were, they're smaller, right? They're more, they, it, they call themselves, you know, like low budget. I think um, Manda Bach, what's her name? Um, the uh, executive producer, uh, I think that's her name, Manda Bach, yeah, Manda Bach. Um, you know, she always says, we're broke, we're broke, we're broke, the season's broke, we're broke. And, uh, you know, and I'm sure, you know, it being a BBC uh, production, like they didn't have, you know, Hollywood money. Um, yeah, Netflix bought them, but that was after the fact, right? Um, they had to, because they, they I, I don't know, there's always, uh, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. like that as, as a result, they started to look at their world and saying, what are the little things that we can do to be convincing? And now they're looking at like, okay, um, we're not going to necessarily show the war. We don't have war money, but 
some of the production design choices, the little yeah. things like the bar. How do we create this and recreate this environment in this space to show some shell-shocked individuals coming into this bar to give the feeling of like they just came out of this war and look at the yeah. effects of it. Therefore, you're now in the back of your mind feeling the yeah. war as yeah. they're talking about these events. And I, I don't right, know. No, a good designer will always create a world bigger than what it is. Um, say more than just what's there or what the scene is about. You know, they expand on the possibilities of what the, what the world will be after or what it was before. You know, you don't need... Um, you know, like I've seen movies where they're just walking and the production design is they're walking within a four walled space um, and they're, you know, uh, it's just lines on the floor and, you know, and, and they have to basically, you know, uh, experience their, 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 their clothing and their actions and the behavior is basically telling you everything about what's in the world yeah. and what's in the environment. Yeah. And so it, 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 that, 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 that that's really Bingo. the key is, you know. You having just exactly what you need to say a lot. Interesting that you say that. So, like, we're talking about war, right? All right, you have brought that up, and I think it's phenomenal. Because if you watch the early seasons of Peaky, in season one, in almost every episode, in just about every other film, there's fire. Have you noticed that? There's flames and there's fire. And the further the seasons get away from World War I, the less you have the fire being a constant theme, like the fire representing war, battle, fighting. Right. You've got these smiths that are hammering, and you've got this these war visuals that are messing it's with subtle, you. By subtle the time piece. you get to season five and six, yeah. when they're now closer to World War Two than they are to World War One, they are now they're in London. Things are it's it's a different it's different. You you're you're backed away from World War One and those influences of World War One, where they're dealing with it in season one and season two. You know, you've got like the Arthur character that's like, you know, he's having PTSD and he's anguished by it, but he's in the midst of this production design that there's fire and there's hammering and there's explosions of, you know, uh, of flames. And I mean, it, it it's all built in to the aesthetics. It's all built into the story. It's all built into what you're trying to communicate even to the audience, where it's causing even for some subconscious yeah. understanding understanding that you don't even know you're understanding you don't know that you're receiving this information but it's coming in and i mean these things are talked about mm -hmm. they are talked about mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely yeah. um so talking let's talk a little bit about you know now that we're on it talking about little lighting design and color composition and how all of that is also integrated into the production design which is huge and i don't know that necessarily especially in our world in the independent film world yes conversations about color are had but i don't know how in depth people are talking about tones color composition you know coming up with a palette for a scene and why that palette is important what that palette is saying about the scene what the palette is saying about the story what's happening in that scene well, it's funny you say that because i always think about the famous uh and the hilarious like you know what this color grade where you're at with this color grade oh you're in mexico with this color grade oh yeah you see orange it's like mexico you see blue new york <laughs> right exactly <laughs> and so it's you know it, it, but it, it it's true we've been you know so accustomed to and to condition to colors to, to think heat to think warmth to think you know uh so uh, sweating and hot or slow and and it it, it it does a lot to the story and what it's oh, yeah. saying. If you were to think Massachusetts, what color? Blue. Some blue. Some blue. blue. Right. Well, uh, yeah, a right. blue. I don't uh, know. Light white. Yeah. Something blue and muted that represents winter. Yeah. 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 I think of like the fighter. You know, the the Christian Bale, uh, Mark Wahlberg, the fighter. Yeah. Something like that. Manchester the Departed. Manchester 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 Manchester. Yeah. 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 Muted. Yeah. A lot of bleach bypass. Bleach. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A ton of bleach <laughs> bypass. Yeah. 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 It's probably because New England is just, everyone thinks it's a depressing. Probably <laughs> <laughs> so covered under a foot of snow. Yeah. yeah. Like but then, like, anything that's like depicting, you know, San Diego, California, it's got that warmth. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, vibrant colors. Yeah. 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 But that's the thing. It's, you know. We're going to start having to switch the script. But there are, <laughs> there are directors who, that's their style. Like, right. that's you true, think true. of, you think of, you know, Ozark. Well, yeah, it's all really, really, really blue, and that's mm -hmm. just the style behind mm -hmm. it. And it's not necessarily because they're talking about a location, but they're trying to convey an emotion. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's talk about um, talking about style. I'm glad that you brought up style. 
Wes Anderson. Yeah. Very stylized director. Yeah. So his his composition, his production design is very stylized, very specific. Everything is very symmetrical. Mm-hmm. Everything is like locked off. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna throw this to, to Hans because I know Hans is, is uh, has a lot to yeah. say about this style. Uh, I don't have a problem with Wes Anderson. No. <laughs> I actually like him. I, I like Life Aquatic, you know. Bill Murray, throw Bill Murray in anything. He's probably good. Uh, and um, Moonrise Kingdom, I think it is, is my favorite movie by Wes Anderson. Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel won, best, won an Oscar for production design. It did. Um, the, have you seen it? Yes. Uh, not necessarily my f- film that... That, that I like, uh, I prefer his other work, but you know, that's just a matter of taste. But that's, that's actually a, a thing where Wes Anderson is a good example of someone who, and I'm, I'm not too sure, uh, I haven't really researched much of the background scenes of who does his movies, but it almost seems like the, 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 the person who does the design for all his movies is the same. Mm. Because all his movies, you look at one film or one, or one scene from a Wes Anderson movie, and you know, that's Wes Anderson. Right. And that's a Wes Anderson look. That is, even how the characters talk is Wes Anderson. And, you know, especially with the composition that you were talking about. And I think that's... Uh, in particular, something important because uh, if someone has a style in which they shoot, like Wes Anderson, who's so unique, yeah. mm-hmm. the production designer has to be well, able to. Yeah, they're put inside that, that box. Community. Right. To be able to communicate his style and vision right. mm-hmm. through the scene with how they shoot. Yeah. Well, yeah, something it, that, 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 I mean, I want to. Uh, just briefly touch upon is like the depth of design you know right. and how design extends beyond just you know the level of the character but it carries through the right. depth of the shot i mean the symmetry he uses it, it speaks so much you know everything that he does with the design is saying something it's almost as if the production design is the main character you it's know? a part of a character exactly yes, absolutely and so, and so uh, shouldn't it should it or should it not be in every film or does it depend on the film well, I mean, that's almost as if, like, like, like Hans says, that's his style. And so it's definitely prevalent in a lot of his films, you know. You know, I, I can't right now think off the top of my head one that it doesn't have that. But, um, but it's, it, it's unique, and that's what makes him, uh, that's why people love his movies is because it's different. It's not the same thing, you know, having just a medium shot on an actor and then just getting everything from the actor. But the fact that I can get something from the background and experience the background before I experience the foreground and the actor is great. It's great, you know, storytelling. Yeah. He's an auteur. Yeah. Uh, he's an auteur in the style of Stanley Kubrick. Uh, right. When you mentioned Xavier. Uh, basically, in regards to the the background being its own character, that's exactly the philosophy that Kubrick carried. Mm-hmm. Like the, the the it's not just the actors on the screen that's the characters that are communicating something, but the foreground, the the scene in which foreground, they're set, mid ground, background, all of it ha- is yeah. important. And you see you see examples of that in like The Shining and, and scenes where you see like that clutter. Uh, in the background where all the books where there's a light shining directly on certain characters representing whether they're part of the, the hotel uh, that, that mystique I don't I mean if you, you just, everyone's seen The Shining so I can spoil it right you know whether or not he's actually yeah spoiler alert <laughs> whether or not he was part of like uh, the, 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 the uh, spirit part of the hotel like Every shot, everything was designed with uh, a message in mind. And, you know, in Kubrick, his idea was that every frame had to tell a story. Every frame was important. Whereas a lot of filmmakers, and, and not necessarily for a bad reason, you know, it's more utilitarian, where it's more like... This shot is serves a purpose to bridge this shot between shot A to shot B. 
right? Or like, hey, I'm gonna film someone picking up a cup, or I'm gonna film someone's feet for some reason. So, <laughs> Tarantino and feet shots. No, but I love Tarantino. But uh, but it's it's that every shot in The Shining, every shot in 2001: A Space Odyssey, uh, it a lot of in, it's in all of Kubrick's film and even Wes Anderson is that the the environment they're in is a character of their own and it's important and it's also itself a, a, a mechanism which is the story is being told. Well, it, it gives really that that range of possibilities. You know, if you're you know, if you're at home in, a, in the kitchen and someone is, uh, you know, it's a film where someone's, you know, breaks into your house, you know, it's a big difference where this film is going to go, what's going to happen and what the character is going to do. If there's a phone hanging on the wall, you know, you're going to go run to that phone and go call 911. If there's no phone there or you pick up the phone, you realize, oh, it's, it's broken. You know, you're, you're building a range of that, that range of possibilities uh, for the films. And that's one thing that I've, I've really enjoyed watching in the design of of, of, uh, of these scenes in, in many films where, you know, there are things that are revealed over time or revealed with the sequence of shots that may tell you, oh, this is what they're going to go for. This is going to give me something behind, um, you know, behind what this what this character may end up doing, how they may get themselves, you know, out of out of the situation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that is that. Uh, that's when you you get into uh, films like like um, drawing a blank, but it's a, a it's a very famous film with the sled. You know, <laughs> Citizen Kane, <laughs> Citizen Kane, where like the sled is in. You don't know what the 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 the, the, the significance of the sled is, and then you only find out. Spoiler alert: that the sled represents his innocence. But it's throughout the movie in key scenes. And I think that, that goes into the example that Xavier set, that in, uh, communication is such an important uh, aspect of being a production designer. Because as a designer, you have to have that sled in the shots so people know that at the final, when you show it, that's what it represents. That's what the movie was about. You know? So it's, it, it can actually make or break a film. In, in, in an aspect of that, like you lose, like what is uh, uh, that, that film? I mean, it's still a great film without that sled. You know, what is, you know, Wes Anderson without his, his uh, the, the way he moves the camera? The production design that Wes Anderson uses is completely different from uh, the Coen brothers. Oh, the Coen brothers. Yeah, and <laughs> so they're completely, they're, they're, they're completely different, but you know a Coen Brothers movie when you see it, and it just goes to show the the the, the, the that level of, of detail required, you know, in regards to you know how the environment you know plays a role. Yeah. Now, um, you know, just uh, just to kind of like wrap up because uh, we could be talking about production design and films forever. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, you know, there is. Um, you know some of our examples that we had that we were still you know, we brought up the Grand Budapest Hotel, but I mean Black Panther, and I think that the, the the production design in Black Panther was the one thing that actually made it stand out. As a right. matter of fact, I think it was because of the production design that people were willing to forgive the CGI mm -hmm. because the Black Panther CGI was, it was rough. Yeah. rough. Yeah. It was rough, mm -hmm. but because the production design, the costume, the you know this world that was created was just so rich. Yeah. People were unique. like, okay, yeah. it, unique. It was different, but the but the rules. Remember earlier we had talked about sci-fi. The rules of sci-fi. The rules of this world were established and they were set, and they abided by it from beginning to end. And they 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 mm -hmm. you know they stuck to their guns with it, no matter how crazy it was. You know, vibranium. Like it, like they stuck to it and. And they created a world, and they cre and the world demanded for a very specific aesthetic. And as a result, people were willing to forgive the the oh they didn't have the budget, they didn't have you know, they didn't have Avengers money, um, but they certainly had you know more than um, Fruitville Station money. And so like they were you know Kugler was able to create something that got people interested, and that was all production design. Really? Literally, the I I, I want I, yes. 
the acting was was great. I'm gonna give credit where credit was due. I think Chadwick Chadwick you know did a phenomenal yeah. job. I think Michael B. Jordan did a phenomenal job. But I think the world that they created was the main success behind um, Black Panther yeah. because it was. It, it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, on level as far as visually how they pulled off the CGI as as the Avengers films. Oh no, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Great Gatsby. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is another you know world winning film. Yeah. The world. Um, it's just, yeah. But the, you know, it's it's different because this world does exist. Mm-hmm. You know, this this is the U.S. in the twenties during the flapper era. You know, where you've got decadence and beauty, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, versus. But what out of that era is shown in this movie is what made this movie so successful. You know, because out of that era, there's you know, there's other you know, there's the the worst parts of of that time that isn't necessary for this film. They wanted to show the beauty, the rich, the splendor, the fun. And uh, that's what kind of made us excited about the times about that era. You know, it's like, oh, wow, this, this, I, I feel it. I see it. I can, if they're believable in this world because of the fact that everything was pristine and they yeah. nailed all the spots. But there's so many movies that have great yeah. production design. I know I have uh, my, one of my favorites. Well, it's really a, um, a director who's consistently, you know, this is his style. He's an architect. John, I'm watching his name and I'm terrible at it. Uh, Kroninsky, I believe it is, and he did Tron. He also did uh, Oblivion, and he is a, like he's okay. Wait, this, this is, is going to be this is going to be our tip of the week. I think for, so. While you're, go- I'm going to let you talk a little bit about yours, yeah. but while Jonathan's talking about his, if everyone can come up with one film that they suggest the audience to view for production design. Oh. All right, so Jonathan, go ahead, talk about yours. Well, I have two movies, but I'll do one because I like one better than the other. I like them both. I'll say them both, but I will say watch Tron because there's so much design and it's a world that's unique. And um, it's, um, I loved it. I love the graphic design in it. I'm a graphic designer by heart. That's what I went to school for. And so I love seeing the art just come to life as a world, you know, as world building. And so um, I would say Tron, Tron Legacy, I believe it is. The newest one? Yeah, Tron Legacy. Yeah. Okay. Mine, my, my, mine would be Lincoln. Cool. Um, I've been, as of late, I've been doing a lot of research to the era because of the series that we're working on right now. But the more that I study Lincoln, um, the more I'm, I'm seeing the depth of choices within those scenes. And it's awesome. It's, what's interesting to me is that like Daniel Day-Lewis steals the show, right? Yeah, like yeah. in any scene that he's in, when he you're watching him and he's doing his Lincoln thing, <laughs> he just clap <laughs> you back to the madhouse. <laughs> yeah, he and, and and I feel like people know it's like nobody's gonna be looking at anything else, right? Nobody's exactly. Gonna be looking at Daniel Day-Lewis, right. but they go through the trouble of making sure that like the depth of design in that movie, it like it encircles him and it brings you to it. It's almost like a painting. You know when like a great when you watch a great painting and you watch the strokes, the strokes are moving your eyes in a very specific, manipulated direction. Mm-hmm. You know, a great painter will get you to look at a painting in the direction that the painter wanted you to look right. at the painting. Right. Once your it's, eyes have been satisfied with yeah. the main action or the main spot of the painting, then it travels. It'll around travel the world. Yeah. right. It's the same thing with Lincoln, and it'll yeah. always land on Daniel Day. It'll always bring you to it, and I feel like that is like. How they did that is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It's phenomenal. So my choice for those of you out there that want to look at an example of great production design, watch Lincoln. It's awesome. Well, I'm a ninety. I'm a nineties kid, and uh, I, I'm, so I'm a sucker. Oh, no. I'm a sucker. Not very much good stuff happened in the nineties. Well, well hey, sorry. Considering... Born in eighty nine, September eighty nine. So <laughs> yeah. But uh, but the nostalgia of the nineties, I, I love it. And uh, one film I saw recently that I think captured it really well. Uh, it was uh, it was called Richard Jewell. And it was about the 1996 uh, yeah, yeah. Atlantic City bombing in uh, right? in the um, uh, it was with uh, I forget the actor's name, but um, but uh, did he direct it? Was it Clint? Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. He, uh, but they they, uh, they they captured that world so well. You know everything. Um, every, you know the '94 Olympics in Atlanta. You know so you got the the Coca Cola. You got the the CNN. You know. And, and every little, tiny little detail in that film um, really sucked you into that, in that moment. You know, moments before, you know, you have people up there, you know, doing the Macarena. Oh, and and awesome. it's like these people in the, you know. The, the Spice Girls. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and, like and it, it had that look and feel, the excitement. You know, you could really feel 
the they, they really pulled that they pulled that out of that film um and and to watch you know something so horrific go down in the midst of this exciting moment i mean they really they captured kind of the inertia of the environment and then the disruption obviously of, of what happened and then obviously the uh you know the the sad tragedy of, of of that man that was that was framed you know in that moment but um in terms of capturing that world i mean that that that's one film i think that's done it um underrated very underrated for that purpose cool hans what you got all right well, what was uh, jonathan's pick uh tron legacy uh, oblivion but tron legacy was mine tron legacy all right i'm gonna do another since you guys basically kind of did two period pieces at the opposite end of the spectrum <laughs> I'm gonna do another sci-fi movie, and I think you guys know it's Blade Runner. Oh yeah, um, 2049. No, no. Oh no! Oh, no, not 2049. <laughs> How 2049. dare you? There's Blade Runner. Not story. 19, 1987. Okay, all right. Oh, I'll wow. give it to, it's your choice. I'll, it, it, all right, the original, Ridley Scott. Don't, oh, don't, don't. I'm a huge fan of Ridley Scott. Ridley, Ridley Scott. Scott's production design in his movies. Uh, oh yeah. Just Black Hawk mm. Down, uh, Alien, Gladiator. Uh, I mean, even as much as you can knock the story and some of the, 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 the plot holes, Prometheus. Uh, but the, I think the, the, the best work he's, I think he's still ever done is Blade Runner. Every, those, the, 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 the shots of L.A. Uh, in the future, it, phenomenal. It still uh, holds up even today. Absolutely. Uh, just and it's unique. It's unique so much that they pay attention. Even stuff like Atari. Even though Atari has not been that relevant <laughs> since the. It's a very since 80s like thing. 80s. <laughs> but but um, uh, um, Denise Villeneuve, yeah. he kept that. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah. Part, you know, hey, production right. design, the environment, it's a consistency. And so. The only yeah. thing that was different in 2049 was the movement of light. I think that was the new idea that, you know, Deacon wanted to bring in with the production designer is the way light danced, you know, especially through the water. So that, I agree with you 100%. The fact, I mean, you have to pay homage to the original because that's where the source comes from. That's the idea. 1987. Uh, but uh, 2049, you know, I, 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 I don't think did a disservice to the original. It, it didn't, it just didn't reach the heights. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Because the the thing is, that's is a that, compliment coming from us. Yes, yeah, it's right. Like it, nothing. It, I think it's just their design choice yeah. is the reason why it's it, it, it's not on the same level production wise. Because you look at, at, at the original Blade Runner, it, it has a it's a film noir, or the twenty forty nine is basically a basic movie, and, and you know, but. Blade Runner is like sci-fi noir, and it still plays with the lights and shadows between the characters, uh, uh, in in the environment, the cars, you know how they uh, uh, how they move. Not only that, the, the 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 culture, the the mesh of of Asian culture and yeah. and European culture, is it, it's never expli explicitly told in the movie, but in the environment. It, it, it goes to show you, like, the fact that he's eating ramen uh, at, at, a, at a booth outside, you know, and they're speaking English. It, it shows that there's a, a mesh of cultures that happened prior. And it's just, to me, it's just the, 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 the environment has, is so unique. And you watch it, and it, everything is so dense. It gives you a sense of, of, of density and character. And when you, you throw in a film noir... And it, it, it still gives that sense of wonder and mystery yeah. throughout throughout the environment, and which is something that Twenty Forty Nine chose not to, because he chose to tell a different story. A different story. And That's so cool. it is not as uh, uh, I, I would say it's not as uh, rich. It's still great though, um, but uh, for different reasons. But for different reasons. But but for a, but for a movie that was made. In, in the 80s to still keep up and still be watchable uh, just goes to show it, I, I, that's what puts it up for me yeah. Yeah. alright well everyone thank you so very much for watching us here just kind of 
Jabber and g- yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And hey, and if you have a movie that you like of yeah. production design, put it on the comments below. Yeah. Why not? Right. I want Absolutely. to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah, I would love to hear it. Um, and then maybe we can even talk a little bit about some of those choices in the next episode, where sure. we are going to dig in a little bit deeper into you know the stages of production and how production design plays out through those stages, from pre-production all the way even into distribution. Sometimes people think, oh, you're done designing, but you know what? No, there's posters, there's you know, all that stuff. It's still play so we're going to talk a little bit about that next week thank you for watching episode 32 hope you enjoyed it yeah awesome yeah just share like subscribe punch that no i can't punch, punch. we've done punch what? yeah we've done punch. knee it maybe like yeah like, just tap it with your toe just <laughs>